In this video, we're identifying a bunch of wide receivers who have the potential to break out this year, or maybe they don't. And I will start by saying we're not going to talk about the obvious guys like Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave, Drake London, the second, third year players who are already being taken in the second round of drafts. It's being assumed that they'll break out. Their draft position right now is already taking that into account. Instead, let's look at some other players who might be values and decide, are they going to be breakouts or not? Starting with the Seattle Seahawks, second year receiver Jackson Smith the Jigba, who was taken in the first round by this team just a year ago. Is he going to break out? Well, his rookie season wasn't the best, but it also wasn't all his fault. The receiver who goes by the name JSN right here, the acronym, you can see in 2023, August, in the preseason, he ends up injuring his hand. He fractured his hand. He missed the rest of camp. Now, he does end up getting out there week one. Speaks to his toughness, his young age to recover, but that hurts a rookie when he's going to miss the final couple weeks of the preseason and getting reps with his offense. Now, if you're not familiar with JSN, he went to Ohio State, and in 2021, right here, his last fully healthy season, what does he do? He has over 1,600 yards, and let me point this out. He was playing with Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson, guys who have gone on to have solid NFL careers so far. For instance, they're both going to be taken in the second round of fantasy drafts this year. This guy was the best receiver on his team during that time in terms of production, which is why the Seahawks then went on to take him with their first round pick last year in the NFL draft. And he was also the first receiver taken off the board with the 20th overall pick. Now the issue for JSN, and this is going to be continuing this year, is that he landed on a team that had solid wide receivers in veteran wide receivers in that and DK Metcalf, one of the most dominating physical presences and athletic presences, the combination in the NFL and then Tyler Lockett who yeah he's getting up there in age but still has been consistent year in and year out so this wasn't great it was hard for him to get on the field in two wide receiver sets but then also it was hard for him to get on the field in three wide receiver sets because the Seahawks didn't run them all that often or at least I should say all that often compared to the NFL you can see right here the Seahawks were 23rd in the NFL under former offensive coordinator Shane Waldron running three wide receiver sets just 42 percent of the time and Jackson sent the jig when they were not using three wide receiver sets and only had two receivers on the field JSN was coming off the field but the good news for for Jackson sent the jig but is he should be on the field a lot more this year 10 to 20 plus percent more because Shane Waldron's no longer there and they have a new offensive coordinator and that man's name as we've talked about him a couple times this offseason is Ryan Grubb and this is a guy who went to the college football championship game last year with Washington he's been there as their offensive coordinator quarterbacks coach he's kind of had a couple of different hats but last year as the offensive coordinator Washington in college football third best offense overall and passed the ball the most downfield but not only that Ryan Grubb used three wide receiver sets at one of the highest clips and it made sense he had great receivers in college last year all three of those guys are now in the nfl this past draft class so yeah the personnel is not the same anymore but he still has three good two great wide receivers in seattle so i think things are only going to get better for jsn this year and I, right now in drafts he's currently going as a 10th round pick ninth round pick depending on the league size that you're in you can see right here is the 98th overall player in drafts adp and my fantasy blueprint which you can get linked down below join thousands of others who are currently getting it risk-free by the way this year just completely risk-free he's going 92nd overall so i'm six spots ahead i do think he's a quality pick here i do like some of the other seattle receivers as well because I think the whole offense will take a step forward. But when I try and answer the question, do I think he's going to be a breakout? I just don't because DK Metcalf, in my opinion, is the alpha on this team, still sees the cheat code targets, which I like to call those targets that you get downfield 20 plus yards and in the red zone leading to explosive plays. And then you have Tyler Lockett, who's only missed one game in his NFL career, continues to be consistent, still beat man coverage last year, even though he's older, and he's going to be the more dynamic player in the slot and out wide, where JSN's kind of pigeonholed into the slot. So is he a good value in draft? Yeah, he's somewhat of a value. I just don't think this is the year that he breaks out. Next up, let's Let's talk to a guy in George Pickens, and I've gotten a lot of slack on Twitter and in YouTube and all these sites, wherever people can say some things from the Steelers fans, I assume, about my ranking of George Pickens. Right now, he's my wide receiver 31 overall. That's right around where he goes in drafts, so I'm kind of with the market on him. And look, he's just a tough one for me to figure out. If you wanted to say, oh, he's an athletic freak, makes crazy catches, I want to draft him, all right, go ahead, but let's add some more context. Because it's all about where he goes right now in drafts. He goes as the wide receiver 28, 53rd overall player, and here's the deal. He's going ahead of Tank Dell, ahead of T. Higgins, ahead of Chris uh, Christian Kirk. All these guys... I would rather have. And now when we look at what happened this offseason, yeah, things got better for George Pickens on paper, at least right now. This is some of the stuff we can talk about. This is from the team changes page in the fantasy blueprint, just like 1% of the things you get. And this is for every team, gets you caught up to speed, you know what to do. So what you see here is Deontay Johnson leaves in free agency or actually gets traded away. So doesn't even hit free agency. So now the wide receiver one should be George Pickens. He was replaced Deontay with Roman Wilson, a third round pick for Michigan. Okay, decent player, not the same uh, level or at least expectation of target earner as Deontay. And then the only other receivers added in free agency we're just a bunch of guys who are like depth pieces might not even make the team average wide receivers in the nfl if that in quez walk and scotty miller and van jefferson right here and another piece of positive information for if you want to call it that for george pickens is he got a quarterback upgrade room with russell wilson now russell wilson hasn't been great the last couple of years you can say what you want about him not the greatest brand out there either so it doesn't really help his case for people wanting to support and back him but i do think he's an upgrade from kenny pickett who uh went in a draft where he was like the 20th overall pick where they just kind of forced a, wide, a quarterback to go in the first round because just teams
Rams needed one. Probably more of a second or third round pick if we really had to be truthful with that. And then Mason Rudolph is the other quarterback. I do think this is an upgrade, at least in terms of just pure experience and ability to throw downfield. So when you look at the Steelers wide receiver room, yeah, all those guys I just listed. Also Calvin Austin here, who's like a gadgety short area of the field player. George Pickens should be the clear alpha this year, but also in years past, we haven't seen him operate as an X receiver consistently as he's been kind of cast into this downfield outside the boundary or numbers uh, type role. But I do think he can kind of win on the inside and he's just going to have to because outside of Pat Fryermuth, a tight end, they don't have anybody else who can consistently move the chains. Now, a major downside though for George Pickens is the fact that he's on the Steelers who led the NFL in running the ball when the games were close last year, 50% of the time. And now they have a new offensive coordinator in Arthur Smith who recently said in an interview, he's going to run the ball 50% of the time. And just to give you an idea of Arthur Smith, when he was with the Falcons last year, when they were trailing by seven or more points, he was still running the ball at the highest rate in the NFL. So yes, Deontay Johnson is gone, but I'm just not sure that George Pickens is now going to be this target hog for the team. He's currently going 54th overall. He's my 57th overall player. So I'm kind of right in line with the market, but I'd just rather have some other guys, definitely Tank Dell, definitely Christian Kirk, and maybe even some players who go at some other positions like an Aaron Jones ahead of where you're seeing George Pickens go right now. I'm just a tad skeptical of him beating the best team's other cornerback underneath consistently to move the chains and this being a run first team. So I think George Pickens has the ability to break out. I just prefer some other guys around him. And now the next guy on here is Jahan Dotson, another former first round pick like we talked about JSN earlier. This is from the 2022 draft, a member of the Washington Commanders. He's entering year three. And trust me, I want to be biased here as a Penn State fan. Jahan Dotson went to Penn State. He was great in college, but we have to use all the facts and take the emotions out of it when we're talking about this and during 2024. And when I say Penn State fan, I don't know if I said fan or alumni. I'm an alumni. Uh, the fandom kind of dwindles as the years you leave college, at least for me personally. Now let's look at his career right here. He had a nice season to start in 2022. 61 targets doesn't sound great, but he missed a bunch of games. He actually outperformed Terry McLaurin in 2022, his rookie year, in the games that they played together in terms of fantasy. 2023, the usage goes up as he stays healthy and plays in every single game, but he's kind of used in a weird way. Because we saw his average depth of target, how deep downfield he was being targeted, dropped by 30%. In college, he was dominant downfield on the outside despite being smaller. We saw that a lot in 2022, but it kind of it left in 2023. The role was completely different. And now his situation entering 2024 will be different because he has a brand new quarterback, the second overall pick in the NFL draft, Jaden Daniels out of LSU. And we get a new offensive coordinator in Washington and Cliff Kingsbury, who you might have thought was in the NFL last year, but he wasn't. He took a step away from college football to go to USC to be a senior offensive analyst, whatever that means. And he vows that he ended up learning some stuff from his stint in the NFL from 2019 to 2022 as the coach of the Cardinals, where he wasn't all that great, wasn't as good of an offensive guru, didn't throw the ball all that well compared to running it actually better than expected. So now he's coming into Washington saying he has a clean slate, saying that he's learned a lot of stuff and it's not going to be his same old ways. And I kind of believe him, but I also want to see it, especially since he has Jaden Daniels, which in some ways compares to Kyler Murray, a mobile quarterback who has some success throwing the ball. What will that lead to for your offense? But the changes also don't stop there for Jahan Dotson because this is a pretty big one. Curtis Samuel is gone. He's gone to Buffalo and Curtis Samuel being on the field last year hurt Jahan Dotson's not just targets, but snaps as Samuel was stealing some two wide receiver sets usage. They replaced Curtis Samuel with a third round rookie, Luke McCaffrey. Yes, Christian McCaffrey's brother. He's out of rice. He's only been a wide receiver transition from quarterback for like the last two years, year and a half or so, but he's actually been pretty good at the position. But all in all, this should be good for Jahan Dotson to be the clear wide receiver two on the team, at least to start the year. Now, the issue is where he currently goes in drafts. And you can see right here in the fantasy blueprint, he goes as the 139th overall player, but he's my 146th overall player. So I kind of think he's valued properly, maybe valued a half around to around too highly right now. And it just comes down to this. I'd rather have guys who go after him. Uh, Gabriel Davis, who I know is going to be in a more pass heavy offense, not with a mobile quarterback goes after him. You scroll a little bit uh, down here more. I'd rather have Dontavian Wicks, the cheapest member, at least I would say of a potential starting core for the Green Bay Packers, which should be a nice offense and showed a lot of flash last year. So when you have this mobile quarterback and you already have Terry McLaurin kind of an established alpha there, it's really hard to expect a second player for that rookie mobile quarterback to pop off and break out. So I'm not really seeing it for Jahan this year. Now we just talked about this guy briefly. Dontavian Wicks, I want to talk about as the next potential player to break out as he enters year two after being a fifth round pick, kind of casted away last year. And a lot of it was because he already entered a Packers receiving core that just had a hodgepodge of names ahead of him. And a lot of these names showed out in 2023. And also this past off season, we're getting positive reports on guys like Christian Watson as he heals from his hamstring injury. When he's been out there, he's been the number one target earner on first reads from Jordan Love and a year prior with Aaron Rodgers. Jaden Reed had a great rookie season. He kind of disappeared at times, which a lot of people don't talk about. Disappeared from the offense completely, but he's shown an ability to win downfield, kind of be this end around guy, gadget guy there, Debo Samuel, if you will. Romeo Dobbs had a great postseason, been consistent, both downfield with his hands getting better over the years and also in the red zone. And you can see some other players. Bo Melton's even been improving on this team, although I think he's kind of a depth piece overall, just a lack of ability with all these other guys to get on the field. And then there's Dontavian Wicks. It feels like I have to breathe because there's so many Packers young receivers, I should point out, that were productive last year in their own rights. But this is the guy I want to focus on, the fifth rounder, Wicks. Now, Wicks 
went to Virginia, where in 2021, he broke out for over 1,200 yards. And then in 2022, he got injured. The offense changed. He only had 430 yards, but they didn't throw that much. He still actually earned 21% of the targets, which was a career high. So his actual ability to earn targets compared to others on his team improved every single year. Even though the production dropped off, that wasn't all his fault. Although the drop in overall production and the fact that he just went to a smaller school and the inconsistencies on film led to him falling to the fifth round, where it was pretty clear early on that the Packers got a steal when he actually started getting there out there on the field. He beat wet man coverage a win rate of over 50 percent that was number four in the nfl not just amongst rookies amongst every single player you scroll up a little bit more as a fifth round rookie on a somewhat limited sample was 24th in yards per out run if you're not familiar this is either the best or one of the two best predictive stats of how good a player is going to be not just now but moving forward pretty good for a rookie now there's been comparisons out there thrown around by the head coach thrown around by some other people in the media that this guy runs his routes like Devonte adams it's a little bit skewed because he's wearing the same kind of jersey and people might just think that when he's out there but i see some of the similarities specifically a lot of it has to do with how he gets out of his breaks off the line of scrimmage his route running his first move really at the line now he started to come alive like a lot of rookies do in the second half of the season from week 11 to 18 that second half he had a top 36 finish so a wide receiver three in fantasy 67 percent of the time and he finished as a top 20 receiver in two of those weeks including his best Best game when they needed it most and it was in week 18 they had to win to get into the playoffs against a division rival the bears and donovan dontavian wicks goes out there catches six of seven targets 60 plus yards a couple of touchdowns crazy grabs as well he was just counted on and he delivered wicks also ranked top 15 in first downs per route run picking up 29 first downs on his limited route tree and i mentioned yards per route run was a predictive stat the other most predictive stat if that's even a way to kind of say that the other most predictive stat is first downs per route run it just shows how your ability to actually make plays when needed most so everything i'm saying about wicks lead you to believe that I do like him and as of right now I do he's 148th overall in drafts he's my 137th overall player in the fantasy blueprint again you can get that link down below so I think he should go around earlier where he does right now but he might move up over the summer so just kind of keep an eye on this and if you play on a site like underdog he might already be going in like the ninth or 10th round and at that point I'm just fine not taking him but I don't believe that underdog's a good gauge to kind of test your home leagues on right now because underdog prioritizes wide receivers if you're familiar with it and also like the best people draft on there right now the wisest people which is not going to be every single person in your league so to answer the question do I think that Tavian Wicks will break out this year and I think he has probably the best chance of anybody we've talked about in this video other than George Pickens at least that we've talked about so far because now let's go over to the Ravens wide receiver room where they have not one in Zay Flowers their second year player but also a fourth year player in Rashad Bateman who have the potential or at least the idea that they can finally have their big breakout season this year and it starts with Zay Flowers who in his rookie year had 858 yards led the team Flowers was the Ravens number one pick a year ago in the first round out of Boston College now during his time at Boston College he kind of had a really productive year he, he was always earning targets here's the big thing like he only had 1,000 yard season barely got there his final year if you look at that but look at the target shares this team is known for running the ball Boston College he was earning the targets every year 27 percent 27 percent and then basically 30 percent and in his final year we had over a thousand yards that was like three times anybody else in the receiving core and then we saw all this production translate to the NFL where Flowers comes into the league and ranks sixth in win rate against man coverage and 15th in yards after the catch now the one issue that we saw with Flowers game and I thought I think there was like one week in like week five or six where we saw this change but it didn't change at the end of the day for the rest of the year was the average target distance how deep downfield he's being targeted we need this to be downfield so we can actually have big plays yards after the catch big touchdowns it was only 81st in the nfl just eight and 8.4 yards per target that's not great you want this to be at least 10 plus yards if you really think a player can break out and have a massive year and be an alpha for his team now this is going to have to change for flowers moving forward if we think he's going to break out and also he's going to have to produce with mark andrews actually healthy because andrews missed some time last year and that helped flowers this is something that i really don't see a lot of people remembering but mark andrews last year ended up missing six games in those six games flowers averaged 17.4 fantasy points compared to just 11 fantasy points when andrews was active and now andrews is healthy he's going to be out there and who knows what's going to happen with flowers i think he's kind of being overdrafted right now in my opinion so again the big key piece here is that we have to start to see more downfield usage either that's just they don't like what they're seeing in practice for him to win on the outside downfield as much or it's just he hasn't had the opportunity with odell there last year and then there's his teammate rashad bateman who's getting a lot of hype uh potential fourth year breakout and they picked up his fifth year option this offseason and they've said all the good all the positive things like yeah he's going to be involved but this man is just a mystery man because even with all that coach speak it just comes down to the Ken Rashad Bateman one stay healthy he hasn't each year in the NFL so far and then this right here all ready to start mini camp this is as recent as me recording this a couple days ago he had a short catch early in practice but his snaps seemed to dwindle later on in the session and then J Lamar Jackson only targeted him once when Bateman was covered well by Mullen on a short shot basically all this is saying is like he's not seeing usage he's not having a good camp so far and a lot of this is day-to-day -day reporting so people can just put out content and it could seem more overblown than it is and then he has two good days at practice right a lot of people aren't gonna have the greatest practices so we don't want to put too much weight into this one practice or start of camp but it's just a little scary when Rashad Bateman has been hyped up probably by myself included the last couple of years as like this late round sleeper and now that they're heading into year four can he finally do it look here's all that I'll
I'll say about the Rashad Bateman buzz right now. He goes 187th overall in drafts. He's my 189th player. So it's not like I have this guy ranked like a great player. He's a 17th round pick to me. That's where he currently goes in the 17th round. I think it's okay to draft him there, assuming that you already have a bunch of other players at other positions slotted in, and maybe he can be a top two receiver for Lamar Jackson and what should be in the second year of this more pass friendly offense with Todd Munkin, uh, maybe an opportunity for a breakout for Rashad Bateman in year four. All that to say, if you've been frustrated with him, don't draft him. It's a 17th round pick. If you want to take a stab, sure. Now we've been referencing my fantasy blueprint, but I want to quickly not waste a lot of your time and just tell you about it. Here's the thing. If you want to win your league, you just click this link right here. And there's a couple options to get the fantasy blueprint risk-free through a couple of our partners. There's also a third option down here, just in case those don't work for you. But here's the big thing. The blueprint is completely risk-free. If you don't make your fantasy playoffs, whatever price that you pay, just a one-time fee of like five to 10 bucks out there. Well, that will be completely refunded to you for a limited time. If you sign up during these summer months right now, and here's the deal. Just reach out. If you don't make your fantasy playoffs for whatever reason, even, even if it doesn't have to do with the blueprint, even if you loved it and you just had a bunch of injuries, you got unlucky. I don't care. I'll give you your money back. Now, how do you get your blueprint that again, thousands of people have used in the past. And also already this year, a record high thousands of people are using and relying and trusting to win their league, smack around their friends, all that stuff. Well, just click the link in the description below or scan the QR code. You follow those steps. The steps are written out step-by-step step for you, very simply put, and you can get your blueprint today. All right. Now back to our beautiful video. We're going to talk about Jameson Williams. If Rashad Bateman is getting a lot of off season hype, Jameson Williams is another guy who's popping up a lot. And is he going to be truly this third year breakout player? Because for a lot of people who might not pay attention until maybe August or September, if you're watching this video, people say, oh, well, he only has 25 career catches, one catch in 2022. Okay, well, let's add context. He started that year coming off a torn ACL that he had in December the previous year in college. And then they just kind of put him on the redshirt year. They were limiting his snaps. 2023, he ends up getting a gambling suspension to start the season, misses four games. That's self-inflicted for sure. But here's the thing that kind of hurts your development for a guy who already was hurt last year and didn't get to participate in the beginning parts of the season and preseason and camp. Some ways heading into year three can be viewed as this actual fresh start for Jamison Williams and a guy that we also saw coming on a lot towards the end of last season. And as of right now in camp and OTAs, again, this can be blown out of proportions, but his own head coach is calling him the most improved player from start to finish in that time since last year to this year is Jamison Williams. He was hyping him up towards the end of last year, hyping him up all the way back in February when the season ended, and now he's hyping him up back again in the OTAs in camp. And the reason why Jamison Williams looks a little bit more appealing this year is because he's in line to start. There's no other receivers behind Amon Ross St. Brown. Josh Reynolds did not resign with the team. Khalif Raymond, I'm not really sure, is going to get the opportunities at least right away over a Jamison Williams. But the issue is also the fact that Amon Ross St. Brown is still there. He's going to be ahead of Jamison Williams. Sam Laporta is still there. In theory, the guy who earned 120 plus targets as a rookie tight end will be ahead of Jamison Williams. And this is a team that is led by Jared Goff, not really known for supporting three guys consistently and still wants to run the ball first. So more at this point where there's a lot of competition on a run first offense, it comes down to what the price on Jamison Williams is going to be in drafts. And I think it's only going to continue to rise this off season. And I say that because that's exactly what I've been seeing so far. Look, he goes 104th overall right now in drafts. He's like a ninth or a 10th round pick. I thought he was a fine pick in the 12th or 13th round earlier this offseason. I said, okay, take stabs on him if you're playing in like best ball. But now he's going way too early for me. He's my 119th overall player for the reason stated. There's just a lot more competition on a run first team. We haven't seen it yet. I think he has a chance to be exciting. But what is his ceiling when he's playing with Sam Laporte and Amon Ross St. Brown? He goes like a round too late. And I think he's only going to continue to rise this offseason because we keep getting these positive reports. And honestly, a lot of it is just double counting. Like stuff like this right here is getting 86,000 views on Twitter because all it's saying is Jameson Williams had a nice day, not an amazing day, not the best day we've ever seen somebody at practice ever had. He just made a couple of lunging catches in a team drill. That's what first round wide receivers, wide receivers in general in the NFL should do. They should have nice days in camp. Nice days in practice, if not great days in practice. This is just double counting the fact that we already have reports that he's having a good camp and stepping up. But it's being used as another building block to draft him even earlier in drafts, and it's just kind of getting out of control at this point. Even if he has a, a better than uh, past year, right? He only has 24 catches last year. Even if he has 50 catches, 50 plus catches this next year, it's already accounted for. All right, now next up, we can go to another wide receiver room. And I want to talk about the Chargers wide receiver room because there's no clear stud alpha here. You have Josh Palmer, you have Quinn Johnson. The rookie second round pick, Lad McConkey, is getting the buzz right now in camp as Justin Herbert's favorite target. Target. This makes sense. He was great in college last year. They traded up to take him in the second round this year. The first person that Jim Harbaugh attached his wagon to as like a, uh, a free agent or an, an NFL draft signing at the position. But even if Lad McConkey is the number one receiver on this team, there's going to be other guys who catch the ball. Even if they are dead last in passing, they're still going to throw the ball 500 plus times this Chargers team. And that's where some of these other options come in. Like Quentin Johnson, is he going to potentially break out in his second year? A first round pick last year and everything went as, uh, let's just say, bad as it possibly could starting in the preseason last year in camp where the guy was just dropping 
dropping the ball nonstop. And then he didn't win one of the starting three wide receiver jobs, Keenan Allen and Mike Williams did, and then also Joshua Palmer. But now Keenan Allen and Mike Williams are gone. However, there's not really a lot to tell us like, oh, Quentin Johnson's going to be great because he saw a lot of run last year because Mike Williams tore his ACL early and Keenan Allen missed a lot of games and he was still 89th in yards per route run. I mean, anything under one yards per route run is like borderline not even going to be uh, within the top four or five receivers on a team, maybe not even be an NFL level wide receiver. But of course, it was early for him. The guy only averaged last year four targets per game. But again, this was without those guys last year. They're not there again this year. So it's not like a totally new situation. Those guys are already not there, although the coaching staff is new. But I think my concern with Quinn Johnson is everything looked as bad as possible. They only used him on an, as an outside receiver to run deep, which at TCU, his frame kind of suggests that that's what he should do. But he was more of a guy who needed to be moved around the formation. Now, the good news is his new offensive coordinator, Greg Roman, who spent time, I believe, three or four years, 2011 to 2014 in college with Jim Harbaugh. He's already saying, look, or in uh, at San Francisco with Jim Harbaugh, he's already saying we've done some different things with him too, not just lining him up on the outside. He's looked good doing that too, but we're really excited about what the future holds for him. They're basically saying that they want to put him in positions to run after the catch. That means being in the slot a little bit more, maybe the why, so he's not having as much attention from the other team's defense and top cornerback. I think all this is great. At least they're seeing that he was uh, maybe miscasted or misused last year as a rookie, and he had a lot of other veterans ahead of him, and he didn't get to get all those snaps in camp preseason, whatever, right? I'm not really thinking that he's going to break out, but the opportunity is there late in drafts. I'd rather attach my wagon right now, which kind of sounds weird for a fourth year receiver, another fourth year receiver talking about like Rashad Bateman and Joshua Palmer, because here's the deal. He's the longest tenured charger right now in the starting receiving core, meaning he has the most established connection three years of that with Justin Herbert. And the dude, all three years of his NFL career, when asked to step up and fill in for an injured Keenan Allen, fill in for an injured Mike Williams, he's produced. Over the past three years, in 11 games with Keenan Allen out, you can see right here on Rotoviz, he's averaged 12.6 fantasy points per game on 7.6 targets per game. I mean, that is strong production for he's currently going in drafts right now as like the wide receiver 50. He's going in the 12th round, and a reminder, in those games, they were still having Austin Eckler in some of his prime years during that time. Mike Williams, too, even when Keenan Allen was out in a lot of those games, and Palmer was still putting up that production. Now those guys are gone. So I'm a fan of Josh Palmer, even if he's not the number one receiver on this team, which I think he has the ability to do. That's what he did in college, and then he was a third round pick. He was his downfield dominant receiver at all different uh, levels of the field. He goes 133rd overall right now in the 12th round. I view him as an 11th to 10th round pick, so I think that he is a value. Now here's the thing. I saw somebody comment, oh, you shouldn't be taking these guys. You have them 19 spots higher than uh, the market. Don't dra draft them there. You shouldn't be overdrafting them. I agree. That's not what we're saying. We're identifying these guys as values and telling you when that round comes around that they're screaming values, not to draft them two or three rounds early. I just wanted to clear that up, and I also want to clear up the fact that, yeah, the Chargers are profiling out to run the ball because that's what Greg Roman, the offensive coordinator, does, and that's what Jim Harbaugh, the coach, definitely does. But it's not like they haven't had productive wide receivers. Let's go back to their time together with the San Francisco 49ers. In 2012, Michael Crabtree had 146 targets. In 2013, Anquan Bolden had 150 targets. And in 2014, Crabtree and Bolden each had over 100 targets. And now they have a much better quarterback in Justin Herbert than they did at that time. And the league in general has evolved into a more pass-friendly uh, offense and uh, the league that favors offenses based on the way that penalties are called and safety and all that. So the rookie Lad McConkey could be a fine pick, but I do think that Josh Palmer in round 12 is also a solid option and does have the ability to break out in this offense. Now, fellas, I was digging into the stats and believe it or not, right now, only 40% of people who watch these videos are subscribed. Nearly 60% don't subscribe. And I have a goal to get that number down to about 50, 50. So if you are not subscribed, take two seconds to check and hit that button. It truly helps the channel out more than you know. Now, the next offense we will look at is the Giants wide receiver core, because I do think they have an alpha number one receiver for sure. And he's a guy that goes in like the fourth or fifth rounds of drafts. And I think that that's far too late for Malik neighbors, a guy who's taken with the sixth overall pick a stud. And we're not talking about him in this video. We're talking about the other receivers here, uh, specifically guys who were taken in the past couple of drafts and Jalen Hyatt uh, in last year's draft and the year before that, Wandell Robinson. Can these guys in this offense as a wide receiver too, based on where they're going in drafts, have a breakout year. And now let's start with Jalen Hyatt, who was a third round pick last year, maybe overdrafted for a guy in college who was like this vertical slot receiver, doesn't really translate to the NFL, but he didn't get a fair shake as a third round pick in the NFL because he lost his quarterback and had to play with Tommy DeVito downfield. Not great. Now I would admit that heading into this year, Daniel Jones coming off of a major season ending injury isn't like screaming confidence for Jalen Hyatt to win downfield. And I kind of feel that way, but at least it seems a little bit better than what Tommy DeVito was doing because Jalen Hyatt was just used in a wild way last year. The dude led the NFL. His average target was 21 yards downfield. What does this tell you? It means that this dude was just consistently getting like 30 or 40 yard bombs downfield that for the most part just weren't catchable. And that's just not a consistent role for a wide receiver to be considered fantasy relevant or a breakout if you're just chucking up long bombs from an inaccurate quarterback who doesn't throw great downfield. Now, the other guy in this receiver core is Wanda Robinson. And honestly, if I'm being truthful, between the two of them, this is the guy that I'm a little bit more uh, appealed by, if you will. I think he's an interesting player. Now, in his final year of college, right before he entered the NFL, look at this. He had over 100 catches, over 1,300 yards, was highly productive. And this part right here is impressive. Target share every single year, 23%, 28%. That's elite. Then 39%. That's as good as it gets at like any level of football for any wide
wide receiver ever. But the issue was he was kind of known as like this gadgety guy, got a lot of screens, got a lot of targets behind the line of scrimmage. And this really hasn't panned out for players who had this role in college in the NFL. I mean, just see guys like Traylon Burks and even to an extent Kadarius Tony. Then Wandell gets to the NFL. He's seeing these short area targets, these gadget targets, but unfortunately he tears his ACL in November of 2022. You can see right here. And this ends up impacting him for part of 2023, missed the first couple of games on the year and remained on the injury report for that knee for 11 weeks. And when Robinson was out there, he ranked 97th in average depth of target and only ranked 34th in yards after the catch. So basically he was getting these short targets, these dump off targets and wasn't able to do anything after the catch. Part of that could be just bad quarterback play, bad offensive line, but overall not great. So the ancillary pieces of this Giants offense behind the Malik neighbors, they seem somewhat interesting, but it's really difficult to see them seeing a ton of meaningful, at least accurate targets and significant volume. But I am fine taking stabs on them late in drafts because I believe in Brian Dable and this offensive staff. And I think uh, for the most part, Daniel Jones hasn't gotten the greatest of reps. I think he hasn't been great, but he's been okay enough for fantasy. Right now, 28 spots ahead of the market on Juan Mel Robinson. I do prefer him uh, pretty significantly over Jalen Hyatt. But if we scroll down here, Jalen Hyatt, I'm 36 spots ahead of the market, but still he's my 196 overall player. I'm not going crazy here. Basically, Wandell is 43 spots higher for me in the fantasy blueprint. That's the guy that I would be targeting. But if you're in like the 18th, 19th, 20th round of your draft, if you even had that many rounds, I do think Jalen Hyatt is a guy who can kind of profile out to have five or six, seven touchdowns in a year and a lot of deep catches. Wouldn't consider either of them though, the breakout type of profile. But wholeheartedly, I believe that this guy does have a chance to break out this year, does have a breakout profile. And that's Rashid Shahid, who I'm buying into as a potential 12th round breakout wide receiver. Now this fella spent five seasons in college at Weber State. And here's the deal. He never had over 700 yards in a year, but he kind of developed as the year went on. He played at a school that didn't throw the ball all that much. And look at this. His special teams usage was insane. 1400 yards. I mean, you're lucky if you see a wide receiver in college get like 300 yards, 1700, 1500 in his final year. Every year having at least 700, you might say, oh, it's just special teams yards. And I would agree with you, but usually that hints that you're the type of player who is athletic, a playmaker enough to kind of be used in special teams, you're dynamic. And that does translate to the NFL or correlates, I should say a small amount, but enough to kind of bring it up. Now it's been an interesting two years in the NFL. In his first year, he was a little bit banged up. He only had 34 targets, but on these 34 targets, he actually ranked top 10 in yards per route run on a limited sample, his efficiency. And then in the second year, he knew, he more than 2x his targets, got to 75, 46 catches, started to be used a lot more in the offense as Michael Thomas, once again, wasn't a part of this offense. And it was Shahid operating as like the wide receiver too. But the problem was he was used in this like exclusively downfield role only. And with Derek Carr not having good pass protection, not a good offensive line, Derek Carr does not do good under pressure. Well, he was pressured a lot and the catchable targets was just 65%, meaning Shahid had 35%, the remaining here of this percentage, not catchable. That was 78th in the NFL. He did not have good targets last year. He was only used downfield. Not great combination with Derek Carr, who's not known for throwing downfield when under pressure. But if you watch this guy's film at all, you can show that he has so much talent. So much talent. Like if he was on a good offense with a good quarterback and coach comparison, I, I want to say like the 49ers is like the obvious one to kind of point out here, the Chiefs. This is a guy who honestly already probably would have broke out in the NFL. Now he does have a new offensive coordinator who comes over from the 49ers, was the passing game coordinator there last year, and then also was an offensive coordinator in 2021 with the Vikings. So a couple of quality offenses. When he was with the Vikings, in 2021. And by the way, this coach name is Clint Kubiak. When he was with those Vikings in 2021, Clint Kubiak's offense ranked top 10 in passing plays per game. So maybe we can actually get a little bit of a different offense here, assuming the offensive line looks better. So when I'm looking at the 12th round of fantasy drafts right now, and I see guys like, you know, Brandon Cooks, okay. John Dotson, we already talked about. Gabe Davis, okay. I really do like Rashid Shaheed. I think that he's a quality option. I think at this point, if you already have like three running backs, your quarterback, one of your tight ends drafted, and this is going to be like your fifth, sixth wide receiver, why not take a shot on Shaheed? Because somebody in this Saints offense is going to have to go out there and win on the underneath. Maybe it's Chris Lave. Maybe they change his role. But if it's not, and you get Shahid in the slot more, winning after the catch, and either way, that should be the case compared to last year, he's going to have a much better year. Now, the next man I want to talk about is Marvin Mims. He enters year two on the Denver Broncos. And this is a guy who you usually would want to invest in when he was a rookie coming out last year. It's just odd if we don't see him get a lot more usage this year because he was taken right here in the second round last year. They traded up for him. And here's the important part. This was the first draft pick for Sean Payton as a member of the Denver Broncos. It was their first pick that year, the first pick that he got to make. And they, he was a part of them trading up for Marvin Mims. And it makes sense. He was a younger player, 21 years old, had success at Oklahoma, ran in the four threes in the NFL combine, the profile, the film, everything looked good for this guy. But the problem is he landed on a team that already had Jerry Judy and Cortland Sutton, and this team just didn't use three wide receivers a lot. You can see right here, 24th in the NFL, the Broncos last year, using three wide receivers just 41% of the time. So the majority of the time out there when they actually called a passing play, there was just no opportunity for him to actually see usage because he wasn't on the field. Now there has been some buzz and talk this off season, although it's not really enough for me to put too much weight behind it of Sean Payton saying at like the, well, the players meeting or the rules change committee meeting Marvin is certainly a candidate to play more snaps because of that with Jerry Judy gone that's what that because of that is but here's the deal this doesn't really mean a lot to me because there's a lot of other wide receivers he's gonna have to compete with a lot I say Cortland Sutton I think is a starter now who's gonna start on the 
opposite side, as I envision this team will still use a lot of two wide receivers and want to run the ball and not use three wide receivers. Well, he's going to have to compete with newcomer Josh Reynolds, who was, who was quality last year, a proven veteran. Fourth round pick Troy Franklin, who did play with their quarterback in the new quarterback, Bo Nix, in college. And then Tim Patrick, who you probably forgot about this blast from the past, but he's still on the team after having two season ending injuries, I believe an ACL and an Achilles, if I'm right, the past two years. So we'll see what's left for him. But on paper, when I say all these names, I do think that Marvin Mims is the most talented of that remaining group, if not the most talented guy on the team. But can we just get him on the field? It seems like something went wrong in camp or he's just not coming along for Sean Payton not to like this guy. And honestly, it could just be blown out of proportion that Sean Payton doesn't like this guy. Maybe he honestly just hasn't been good in practice. And instead of saying that, he's trying to kind of save face. Now, Marvin Mims goes in round 15 of drafts right here. At this point, I think it's an okay option to be taking him. I mean, like the other options would just be a bunch of other rookie receivers. Do you want Marvin Mims in year two? Or do you want to take a chance on a rookie like Roman Wilson on the field? Uh, Jalen Hyatt, you wait a little bit more. You get Javon Baker, the other Patriots wide receiver. I don't think that this is a breakout type player for Marvin Mims, but I wouldn't be shocked if at the end of the year, he's the wide receiver one on this team finishing as like, you know, the wide receiver 30 overall. Now let's move to a guy who I do believe had some breakout upside and just had an injury scare in camp. Now we went in depth on Cleo Shakur in a recent video, and here's the deal. The Bills third year player, the injury that he just sustained in camp does not seem to be major. Everything as of this recording seems to be okay. And he's entering a Bills wide receiver room that this year that doesn't have Stefan Diggs, doesn't have Gabe Davis. And as of right now, there's not like a clear alpha. You can see right here, they have a new wide receiver in Curtis Samuel. Okay. A solid player, still just 27 years old. I think that he's a good player. And then there's Keon Coleman, who it seems like as of right now, all the reports from the GM, Brandon Bede, the head coach and also the quarterback Josh Allen are that they're shaping up for Keon Coleman to like be the wide receiver one on this team makes sense they took him with the first pick in the second round they basically could have taken him in the first round if they didn't trade back two more times he's a big wide receiver succeeded at Florida State but also the film is a little bit suspect for him to win on the outside in the NFL there was some hope that he would enter a team where he can just play in the slot right away like a la Chris Goblin back in the day Allen Robinson for some years just this bigger plus size slot wide receiver but on this team where you have a smaller Curtis Samuel smaller Khalil Shakur he's gonna have to be on the outside and honestly that just kind of gives me a little bit of work and opens the door for Khalil Shakur, who started to come alive last season, started to put together a lot of good games. In the second half of the season, he started to play more in three wide receiver sets when the Bills went to a new offensive coordinator, and he saw 32% more snaps, which led to some fantasy production. Shakur posted 15 or more points in 42% of his games last year. And a reminder, he didn't start to come on until the second half of the year, and Gabe Davis and Stefan Diggs were on the team last year, and now they're not. More opportunity for potentially Shakur to break out even more. So in these wide receiver rooms where there's not a clear alpha, like we talked about earlier, Dontavian Wicks and the Packers, I do like taking the most uh the cheapest guy in drafts assuming he still has talent and a nice profile and we've actually seen it in the nfl and that's what clear sure shakur gives you he goes like a half a round to a round later than curtis samuel and like three to four rounds later than keon coleman so i do believe that shakur kind of falls into the bucket of a couple guys we talked about in this video like dontavian wicks george pickens to an extent uh rashid shaheed as guys who actually have a chance to break out now one more player i'll mention for deeper league teams if you're in like a 12 team league with like 14 bench spots six 15 total roster spots whatever it is 16 total roster spots not bench spots uh don't worry about this but if you're in a dynasty league in a deeper league Jalen Turbert, somebody to point out, third year with the Cowboys. He's been very open and honest and honestly vulnerable, saying that it was really tough for him to leave South Alabama in college and go right to Dallas, the Dallas Cowboys, the biggest franchise in the NFL, and try and learn the playbook and keep up with those expectations. Because that was a year that he was coming into two years ago where he was going in like the 10th round of fantasy drafts because all the hype was this guy could maybe be our savior opposite C.D. Lamb. Amari Cooper is gone. We need a second receiver. And the fellow was honest and transparent that a lot of that pressure got to him. And it makes sense for like a 20-year-old kid to not be able to live up to those expectations with the crazy Dallas media, but at least right now, last year, he learned the playbook, started earning more snaps. Right now, him and Jalen Brooks, an undrafted free agent, I believe, maybe a seventh round pick, think undrafted free agent. Right now, they're having a nice offseason camp battle for that wide receiver three job. Some days, people are saying, oh, it's Brooks looking good. And a lot of days, people are saying, oh, Jalen Turbot looks great. I don't even know what I just said there, Jalen Tolbert. It's because I've been talking for like over an hour at this point recording this video. Just bear with me. Now, in terms of the topic of what we're talking about here for breakout receivers, no, I don't see it happening. You have CD Lamb who had 180 targets last year. You have Brandon Cooks, who's getting older, but still a solid year last year, having a good camp. He's behind those two guys he's behind Jake Ferguson I do think the Cowboys are going to throw a lot so if he can be out there in three wide receiver sets and they might lead the league in three wide receiver sets well then yeah he could be a value where he's going in like the 18th 19th round of drafts if you do want to choose him so these are all the potential breakout wide receivers and us breaking down do we actually think they're going to do it or not now if you want to see the guys who are the breakout potential players at the running back position and also the top 30 running backs for this year well check out this lovely videos to videos right over here and if you made it this far in the video make sure to hit the subscribe button i appreciate you a ton it helps the channel grow and i'll see you in the next one